with a £5 million investment for a company of this size is significant. I suppose I'd ask you, do you think that's where the growth will come from, this investment? Yes, I, I think the growth should come from demand for their products. And I, I guess this investment is to meet that perceived future demand. The risk is that they do the investment and the demand doesn't come. So it is not without risk, but it does show ambition when they're putting in half their market cap almost uh, of investment in the next year or so. Hello, and uh, welcome back to the Investors Roundtable podcast, a three-way discussion between myself, Roland Head, and my fellow private investors, Graham Neary and Mark Simpson, where we discuss interesting UK shares, our portfolios, and answer your investing questions. In this episode, we'll discuss pawnbroker H&T, flooring specialist Aria, and property group Henry Boot. We'll also take a look at some recent news regarding vaping and the possible impact on one or two popular stocks, and take a brief look at some of the main things we look for when analysing company accounts to help us form an initial understanding of a business. Before we get started, I just want to share a short disclaimer. All of our comments do reflect our personal views only and should not be taken as financial advice or recommendations. So please do your own research or seek professional advice if needed. With that said, let's get started. Graham, Mark, hello. It's great to be with you again. Hi, Roland. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks for hosting, Roland. Appreciate it. So, Graham, I think this is probably a stock you've followed supreme. The I think the shares are down today. We're recording this on Monday, the 29th of January, and news has emerged that the government is going to ban single-use disposable vapes, which is a big part of supreme sales at the moment. So I wondered whether it's worth taking a quick look at what you think the potential impact is for Supreme, whether it's still of interest, and maybe more generally for all of us, how we tend to react when some kind of bombshell drops that hits one of the shares in our portfolio. Graham, what's your view on the situation? Yeah, so the plan from the government is a blanket ban, effectively, on disposable vapes, and it will probably take well over a year to be implemented. So it might be by the end of 2025, in fact, by the time that it is implemented. But it, it's a big deal for Supreme. I was reviewing Supreme's interim results, which came out towards the end of last year. Um, and I think it's about a third of their revenues were, in fact, in the disposable vape category. So very significant potential blow to revenues. Now, there's a few other things that go along with this legislation. One of them is that they're going to try to stop loopholes where manufacturers could put a USB port on a vape and say that it, therefore it's not disposable. I'm led to believe that is the case at one or two products sold by Supreme that they have a, a USB port on them. I wonder if they just need to tax things sufficiently. If you can make a reusable vape cheap enough that it's not in the interest of people to reuse it. Now, that's another way of getting around the ban, isn't it? So I wonder whether the way governments often work with these things is to add some taxation in or maybe some minimum pricing. But yeah, you're right to focus on that they want to close these loopholes as well. Yeah, and I think the, these loopholes are relevant to Supreme, who sell their own branded vaping kits and disposable vapes and then third party vapes as well. There's another point about flavors, trying to ban flavors that might appeal to children. And then I suppose the point about cost is very important. I was looking at 88 Vape, which is Supreme's own brand of vape. And it looks to me as if their reusable vapes are actually quite cheap already. In terms of trying to prevent children from buying them, or in terms of, from an investor point of view, trying to work out what's the impact on Supreme, will it make a big difference if there are cheap vapes that are reusable? It seems to me as if there are cheap reusable vapes already, starter kits, they're called. So... I suppose the bottom line for me is that I've decided to keep an overall positive view on Supreme just on the grounds that they do have probably the best part of two years to prepare for this legislation. And when it hits, it's not clear to me that there'll be a huge change if people can switch to substitute products that are basically the same thing at cheap price points. So it is a big news story, but I think it may have been priced in already. Supreme was trading at six times earnings. 
it had already been derated quite a lot. And if you look at their um, plans, so if you go back to their half year results, they announced what they called proactive measures to combat underage vaping. This included things like reducing the use of color in 88 vape packaging and using age appropriate names for 88 vape flavors, which was getting ahead of the legislation because they obviously they were involved in the consultation for the laws that were being drafted and they could see this coming down the tracks that flavors would be banned that might appeal to kids and that's something that's happened in other parts of the world as well overall i'm still positive on supreme but it's definitely a tricky one all this regulatory risk does get complicated but i'm not sure if you guys have any thoughts on this one it's worth mentioning that the, just as we were speaking, I've just spotted that they've had an intraday trading update. In, they've said that they're trading significantly ahead of uh, market expectations and they're introducing a, a share buyback and that they claim that their outlook is unaffected by the proposed changes. So obviously they're coming back swinging to the market concerns over this. I think that they're probably right short term that they will be unaffected by this. And obviously the trading statement means they're trading very well. The concern I have that it doesn't necessarily translate into more long-term and medium-term outlook for them. The more people that get addicted young to these products, the more they have demand for vaping. If this does cut out that kind of growth area, potentially they're back into a product that's more like their batteries and LED lighting, which is growing very modestly. It feels like they've doubled down on the vaping side as well, or the disposable vapes recently with distributing, I believe, Elf Bar and some of the others. It doesn't seem to me like this is actually great news for them, but equally, they were so cheap in the first place. What about you, Roland? What's your... Thoughts. Yeah, I think it's probably worth saying the when you look at the chart, Supremes, the share price has halved since the start of 2022. As you say, it's been coming down the line and I think quite a lot of this is priced in. I think the shares are on about six times forecast earnings now. So it's almost a tobacco stock kind of rating. But I'm, I'm thinking I'm with you in the short term, I'm sure they'll probably continue to do well, but it's hard to see this really being a positive factor overall. A lot will depend maybe on whether there is some substitute product for these Chinese disposable vapes, which seem to be driving such a lot of volume and such a lot of bad headlines as well. Uh, at the moment, they seem to be behind the government's proposal, as far as I can tell. But I suppose more generally, probably, I know I've been in this sort of situation, I'm sure you probably have, where something goes wrong with the story. The financial impact is hard to quantify at first. I think some people speaking to people will drop a stock as soon as some kind of trouble emerges and then wonder afterwards and then have a look at it afterwards and see what happens. And other people, which probably would include me, tend to wait until the facts gradually emerge before making a decision rather than rushing into any trading. How do either of you approach these sorts of situations? Are you like a patient holder because you're going to wait for the facts or do you uh, shoe first and ask questions later? Graham? Sure. I hold stocks for far too long, always. So I will tend to hold through just good and bad. But personally, I accept a lot of regulatory risk in my portfolio. I always have. I don't know why. Some kind of character flaw. I just accept regulatory <laughs> risk and low... I, I love getting a low valuation when there's regulatory risk, but sometimes I do get slacked in the face as a result. This is the first time that I've been doing a podcast and had breaking news on a stock while doing a podcast. Yeah, we've had a, we've had an amazing update from Supreme with a buyback and a very confident outlook there. So that's very interesting. But yeah, in terms of how I deal with these instances, yeah, as an equity investor, I embrace risk. As a fixed income investor, I'd, I'd obviously have to take a different angle. I think we all have our blind spots with risk in some level, like political risk is one for me. I often will take I'm not that concerned about political risk in terms of like country risk. I see it as diversifiable. It's something like I, I can have a small amount of stock that's exposed to, I'd say, Mozambique and Kenya, and it's unlikely to be the same issues affecting both countries. So therefore, I see that as diversifiable. And I guess the same point with the regulatory risk as well. It's soft and diversifiable. 
that the point is you have to be diversified. You can't be like, oh, I've got 50% of my portfolio in Supreme and think that, oh, I don't mind facing regulatory risk. It's, it's that sort of thing. Just because it is diversifiable, you do have to diversify. What do you think of the management here? Because I think that's a negative point on these guys. Supreme. Yeah. I think it's still the founding family who control more than half the shares, don't they? So yeah. what's your sort of negative slant on that? Because I know they're well, positive about family ownership. Yeah, I guess the fact that the, the management doubled down on the strategy of disposable vape or appeared to double down on this, e even after it was clear that this was a growing area for children, and then adding into the fact that they made a political donation recently that we can't say why they made that political donation, but you know, you just don't know with these things. <laughs> but there's a couple of negative points for me there where I don't fully trust the management. And when they own 57% of the shares, that becomes more of an issue to me than if they owned 10% of the shares. Yeah, that's a fair point, I think. Do you have a view on management, Graham, at Supreme? I don't know it in as much detail as Mark, but I had the impression that they were fully committed to it, that it was their baby, if you like, that they brought it to this point. And I suppose it's generally something I like, but you do go over 50%, I suppose. That's when people start to get a bit nervous about maybe going private at some point at a price that's not fair. But I thought that they were pretty safe and solid pair of hands. That was my impression. I think they are. Yeah, they have been running the business a long time, I think. Just one of those situations, I think, where we'll just have to see how it unfolds over the next couple of years. But talking of businesses with regulatory risk and long histories, probably it's a good link into our next stock. I think Graham, you have been looking at H&T, the pawnbroken group recently, haven't you, after their recent profit warning? Yeah, so this is a stock that used to be the top holding in my portfolio. I don't own it anymore, but I was very interested to see how low the share price fell recently. It fell back to levels that were within shouting distance of where I had actually sold it a few years ago. So that got me very interested. They had a profit warning on the 23rd of January and the, the share price fell 15% that day. But really the results were excellent in a lot of ways. So the, the shares are now at six times earnings, but basically the market was disappointed that the retailing side of the business wasn't quite as strong as hoped. So again, that seems to come back to just consumer sentiment, retailing sentiment, which obviously is something that we would talk about regularly. I think H&T is very interesting as well in comparison with Ramsden's. I know I'm supposed to be mostly talking about H&T, but Ramsden's also had a slightly disappointing or slightly cautious update in January. But at the same time, I would say it was a strong update from Ramsden. So both companies are highly profitable. Both companies have been growing their store estate. And for me, H&T is the most interesting one because they have a really impressive pawnbroking pledge book. And I tend to think of it as a financial stock more than a retailer. The pawnbroking pledge book at H&T went up 30% in 2023 to over 130 million pounds. So an enormous pledge book. And I'm not sure what the exact rate is now, but I know that previously they would have charged maybe 9% or 10% a month on loans in that pledge book. An, an enormous cash machine there. Um, it seems that in the retailing arm, um, there was just an issue with watches for a start. Um, investors in watches of Switzerland have suffered a lot. Um, I don't know what's going on with watches. It seems that there was a short-term volatility in the demand and supply of Rolexes and extreme high-end watches, and that's come off now. That's been the weak point, but the gold price is still very strong, and that helps the gold purchasing side. Foreign exchange is robust because the tourism industry is doing reasonably well. There's enough people going on holidays now to sustain demand for holiday money. And so th those are the two other bits of the business. So overall, I've been a long-term fan of this business. I think if you objectively look at the H&T's results and trading update, you would say they haven't quite done what they wanted to, but they're still growing and they're still healthy. So I'm very interested in this. I think the earnings multiple came back again to the region of six times, about six times earnings for a, a business that's the biggest in its industry by a mile in terms of pawnbroking. And in terms of regulatory risk, I think that issue is settled. 
personally. Again, as I said at the start, I do have a bit of a blind spot with regulatory risk. But even having said that, the government has cracked down on payday loans. Lending is highly regulated now. And pawnbroking has survived all of that pressure beautifully because it doesn't ruin somebody's credit rating if they default. They could walk away from the loan with basically no repercussions. So they don't have to pay the interest if they can't or they don't want to. I think pawnbroking is a highly attractive form of lending, both from an investor point of view and from a consumer point of view. I think regulators are comfortable with it. H&T has been around for over 100 years, trading at six times earnings. I have to say, I like it more than ever today. Mark, what do you think? Is H&T on your value radar? So I'd agree it looks cheap if it hits those forecast numbers. Where I have a problem is I have some serious doubts over those forward numbers. <laughs> And it comes from the management recent behavior. So they did effectively a sort of closet profit warning in December via the brokers. So this is where they don't issue an RNS to all shareholders. They merely tell their brokers to cut all of the forecasts. And unless you're on it and you're getting notifications from their particular broker, then the share price starts falling and you have no idea why. And this is what happened of 11th of December is Shaw brought out a note that said upward pressure on costs was the title. And they took sort of 10% out of FY24 and 13% out of FY25 with some big cuts on the dividends as well. So obviously they feel like the cash flow is at risk from these downgrades as well. So to me, that's bad form, really. You should be putting this sort of stuff out through RNS. So all shareholders have a level playing field on this. I believe the short sure note is publicly available, but it's very easy to miss. I'm not a holder, but I missed this until the share price was starting to fall. And then you fast forward to this year, you know, you get a trading update from them. And they've missed the forecast. They've missed the trading that they updated short to in early December. But when we did the trading update, sort of 23rd, so six days ago. And this is trading update to 31st of December. So it's taken them three to four weeks to roughly add up the numbers and realize that they're missing what they thought they were going to do and quite a big miss to where they thought they were going to do just two months ago. So I just think there's a bit of a smell here on how up-to-date management are with their systems and how willing they are to share these updates via RNS. For, for me, because of all this uncertainty, I really want to be looking at some kind of discount to assets. Asset earnings come and go, but assets are, are pretty fixed. I definitely see there's a business, there's a case to be buying this share. It's pretty close to tangible assets, but I'd really want something like £2.50, some level like that as a margin of safety given this kind of slightly concerning recent history. I guess you followed this, Graham. Was this a surprise to you? Yeah, the issue is really the living wage. And everybody knows that the living wage is, is going up. So as far as I understand it, that is the main cost that's impacting them. And they referenced it again in their recent trading update. To me, living wage is not something that would be a fundamental reason not to invest in the stock. It, it but does. it's also not a surprise, is it? It's not like they've suddenly looked at their payroll and, oh, it's gone up. Again, casts a bit of doubt on how good their modeling is or how good the visibility in their business is. Yeah, I think management is probably one factor with h and I know we're supposed to be talking about h and as, as Graham said, but I find it hard to look at h and without also thinking about Ramsden's and inevitably comparing them. And so with h and I think, as you say, the management guidance, maybe has been a little bit off, perhaps, or maybe not as forward looking as it might have been. And whereas Ramston's, I've always had quite a strong impression of the leadership there. And I think uh, the chief executive has been in charge a long time and owns some shares in the business. I think he led a previous buyout or, or something of that nature, if, if memory serves me correctly. So I suppose that's one point. And the other thing with h and is the profitability has always seemed a bit average, really, to me. Return on capital employed about 10, 11% certainly in recent years. So with the shares trading around book value, that seems perhaps maybe more like the right sort of valuation than necessarily cheap. But having said that, I don't see anything really fundamentally wrong. I just think that I would probably prefer to buy Ramsden's as a bit of more of a diversified model. 
personally have a slightly more favorable view of management. And it also seems to be more profitable with return on capital, more like 20% than closer to 20% than 10%. Maybe for me, a better alternative rather than saying that h and is bad in itself. I think I agree with that. Certainly on the, the current forecasts, what I would be concerned about why I don't own Ramsdens is the dependence on the FX side. I think that the higher proportion of pawnbroking that HT has is makes them a more resilient business, certainly in the current markets. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I think the FX has been growing, but maybe, as you say, it might not be quite as resilient or robust in different market conditions. There are two different businesses in many ways, despite us comparing them, but it's hard not to contrast them to some extent, I think. Graham, did you have anything else you wanted to add about H&T or all yeah, Ramsdens? I think for me personally, the, the main issue with H&T, if I was to make a bear case, would be the low returns, whether you do returns on equity or returns on capital. You get something that's in the, the low teens, it's either 10% or 12% or something around it. That is a little bit underwhelming. But against that, the fact that it is primarily in the lending business, I think, gives it that extra stability. Even though retail was blamed for the recent profit warning, the company can do very well just on its pledge book alone, I would argue. And so there's a lot of stability there. But I like both companies. I think that Ramsden's a little bit more ambitious in terms of its expansion. It's expanding geographically into areas where H&T has traditionally been extremely strong in the Southeast. Ramsden's is opening up new shops basically around the corner from H&T stores. And so far it's going fine, but those H&T seems a little bit more settled geographically. Just something to watch out for. Okay, so moving on to the next company we're going to look at. Mark, I think you are talking about Area. It's quite a small company, I think. Yeah, it's a flooring specialist and it's been around for a while. And it's the sort of value company that I've looked at in the past and always come to a conclusion that it's a bit of a value trap. However, I, I think there's reasons to be slightly more positive or, or certainly reevaluate the, uh, the business case here. So they particularly do contract carpets and carpet tiles. So this isn't carpets that go into your home. They're typically kind of education, leisure, commercial, healthcare, public sector type businesses that are buying these carpets and they're also putting in some snazzy designs and it isn't just here's a beige carpet it's about creating spaces and areas demarking kind of meeting areas from open plan offices and things like that using the design here and I think as working areas become a higher part of productive offices and productive organizations that this is potentially a trend that can build they are a tiny market cap. They're about 12 million. So it really isn't for everybody, this sort of business, but it trades at a pretty big discount to tangible book value. I'm getting a figure that's about kind of point, point 0.6, point 0.7, depending on the price on the day and, uh, and how you value some of the asset. They have some of that is property that they have on the books as investment property. So that's property they're not using themselves, but are renting out. They've got a reasonable amount of fixed assets, but still the, the bulk is cash inventory, the kind of liquid assets that you'd expect from a, a trading business. And in my mind, they were an uninvestable a couple of years ago because they had a CEO who managed to sell his shareholding to the employee trust at an all-time high. For me, that made it uninvestable. But they've got a new CEO and kind of middle of last year or towards the end of last year, they had a new CFO. And often in this case, you see the market is worried about the actual trading of the business when you lose a CFO. And you can see that the price was about 40p odd towards the beginning of 2023 or, or about a year ago. It kept going down to almost the low 20s earlier this year. So very much the market's pricing a, a profit warning here. Yet the last trading statement was pretty reasonable. Low double digit growth in revenue. And the other thing that's marking them out is they're investing about £5 million in their manufacturing facility which means that they're, they're really expecting some level of sales growth here. So it's gone from a business under a kind of old management that looks like it was happy to just tread water to one that's uh, investing from their own cash balances and some debt. 
into the manufacturing facility, they will substantially increase capacity, include the automation of certain processes, latest cutting edge technology. It's not without risk, this sort of investment, but also they clearly see a future that's different to their past. And often this sort of management change plus a more aggressive strategy can lead to good returns. So it feels like to me, like the sort of situation where, again, I won't put a big proportion of my portfolio in this sort of business, but it looks like a kind of low risk opportunity because of the discounts, tangible book value. It is profitable. There's no forecast in the market. So you have to do your own pinch of salt here. I, I think forward earnings maybe is about nine. And if they only generate 10% sales growth the following year to be on P of six, and then they can keep that building capacity and building growth of sales, then I, I think they could easily be on a very cheap rating. To me, it seems a sort of heads I win, tails I don't lose too much business. Although, yeah, is this going to be a, a massive multi-bagger? Probably not, but I could easily see this sort of doubling within the next couple of years with a bit of a tailwind behind it. Thoughts? Graham? I agree with two things you said, Mars. Firstly, I agree I wouldn't put a big percentage of my portfolio in it. And secondly, I agree it won't be a multi-bagger. I've had a tough time with flooring stocks and carpet stocks. The first question I'd ask, is there any intellectual property here? I can see they've got registered trademarks, which hopefully are worth something. Bermatex, their main brand, and they're talking about the special features of their products, carbon neutral and so on. So maybe there is some intellectual property there. But yeah, I have a really tough time with carpet companies and flooring companies. Margins are just so low. Demand seems to be volatile, like many other sectors, but probably more than most. And then this one being focused on commercial flooring. I wonder, does that mean that demand is more volatile than residential flooring or less volatile? Maybe more volatile. I'm not sure. My feeling is the cycles are probably longer than the vehicle, but the cycles are probably a bit longer. It takes a lot longer to build office blocks and that kind of thing than it takes to build just a, a house. So, and I think that there is a trend for more sort of cohabiting offices. I know what used to be, a, is it IWG are very much pushing a, a model of a we work lights model, a profitable we work model. But also I think that could be an opportunity where people want an attractive office rather than, oh, there's no capital, we're not going to invest. It's going to be a case of we need to have a nice office that people want to rent from us. So I, I think there's some risk, but I think there is also some trends that might help this area. Yeah, I suppose one thing that struck me, you mentioned there's a new chief executive and a new CFO, and they've come from credible companies, I think, in the background, uh, in the past, Croda International, Kingfisher, Genuit, past employers of one or the other of them. I suppose the only thing that is maybe possible is that they don't seem to have spent a lot of time at smaller companies, at least not recently, whether they may feel a slight inclination to splash the cash to try and scale up without keeping in mind the size of the business. I don't know. But yeah, they, they, they seem like credible people with plenty of relevant experience. And, and as you say, the balance sheet looks okay. Although I wonder about for a business that's you know, nearly a third of the market cap for something that's basically not a part of the operating business. I haven't really been able to find out what the history or the rationale for this is, whether it's just something they've been left with that they used to use or whether it's something they've actually acquired for that reason. Yeah, no, I think it's something that they used to have use of and that they've, they've hived off. But I don't really know why they still hang on to it. I would hope that the new management to take a close look at that might not be the time to have a fire sale of industrial property assets. But equally, I think surely the long term aim of that is to get that off the books and that capital reinvested into the business. They say that it's held at fair value based on an ex estimated market yield of 8.6%. So whether that's a realizable value, it could be an attractive purchase for someone, but whether the market's there at the moment. I suppose it's an interesting little business. You worry maybe that it's a bit subscale. And, and another thing on a related note is apparently James Halstead, which I would say is the far higher quality, larger business in this sector. They looked at buying Aria a few years ago and, and decided not to for some reason that we don't know. But I can see why you might have considered it a market. It seems to be reasonably well backed. So that, like you say, the downside should be limited just by the sheer volume 
value of the tangible assets. But looking at the history, I'm not yet convinced that it's about to embark on a kind of sustained period of growth. It doesn't seem to have happened very much in the past. And you wonder if it's a little bit subscale, like their main export market, they say seems to be Poland. And they say that some exports have been affected by the Ukraine war. It's a bit niche. And whether that's a niche that's got potential or not, it's, I don't know enough about it really to form a view. The other thing is with a with a market cap this low, you're venturing into the territory where if it doesn't grow, the listing becomes really questionable. I don't see how companies at a ten million pound market cap should be listed for the long term, given the cost of being listed. I see that they were bigger up until twenty seventeen when they sold the, the residential side, they were bigger and then the listing makes good sense. But at this scale, I don't think so. The shares don't seem to be very liquid. When you look at the major shareholders, they seem to have more than half of the shares locked up anyway. So if they're not trading, then the free float is tiny. So it's definitely in the nano cap section of the market, which brings its own special risks. Yeah, it's definitely very niche. Yeah, a couple of criticisms that I'd like to see them address. The first is that they've never declared the gross margins. And they claim that's competitive advantage and revealing too much to customers and things like that. And I just don't believe that. I think that how many other businesses don't show gross profit. So it's hard to model what the impact is, even assess what the competitive advantage is of the trading business because of these property assets and the, the other assets they hold. And, and the other one is that they've not, they've historically not really done any management presentations, that kind of thing. And I would have hoped that would change with the new management team. But so far, I've not seen anything announced. So that's the couple of things I think that actually if they're serious about keeping their listing and they're serious about growing to be a, a scalable business that is growing and has this stuff. Even though they don't need the capital, they need to be talking to shareholders. They need to be building both sides of their business because actually there might be a time when they need to do a deal to scale up. And if they haven't built the shareholder base, then won't be supported. Yeah, that's a good point. I think the lack of a bit more transparency maybe would give more credibility to their claims that they can be a bigger business. And I suppose one other thing I did notice is they seem to have a relatively sizable pension scheme for the size of the business. I think the assets at the end of 22, the pension assets were about 35 million, which was a big drop that year. And they're paying out about 3 million in benefits each year to pension scheme members. So we don't really know what happened to the pension assets last year. And there don't seem to be any funding requirements at the moment. But I guess it's perhaps not something you could rule out altogether. When the assets of the uh, book value of the business is about 17 million, I think. So that's about half the, the value of the pension scheme assets. So potentially there's a little bit of a risk that it could require more cash at some point. But uh, as I say, that sort of thing, I think we're going to see quite a lot of changes in the status of companies' pension schemes in terms of funding, probably, over this period. So perhaps that's not going to be such a problem as it has been. Yeah, there was a time that it looked like the equity was worthless to me because they, they were making the, the same pension contributions that they were making in cash. But to give the old management credits, they did turn the business around and it has generated cash and those pension contributions have, have gone away. But yeah, you're right to raise it as a risk. It probably needs a bit more work from me on exactly what those assets are and what the expectations are of that scheme. Apologies if you already mentioned it, Mark, but they're talking about this £5 million investment in a manufacturing facility, which will be funded from their cash, their bank facilities, and their cash generative operating activities. And they say that will be transformational. With a £5 million investment for a company of this size is significant. I suppose I'd ask you, do you think that's where the growth will come from, this investment? Yes, I think the growth should come from demand for their products. And I guess this investment is to meet that perceived future demand. The risk is that they do the investment and the demand doesn't come. I can think of Tandem, for example, built a massive distribution facility, bought freehold property on it. And then it seems like the demand for their products has, has largely collapsed. And yeah, they, they barely make a profit and have a big overhead instead. So it is not without risk, but it does show ambition when they're putting in half their market cap almost out of investment in the next year or so. So I think it's probably uh, a good time to move on to our next company, which is Henry Boot. And so this is another £150 million market cap. So relatively small, but not a micro cap. 
been around for more than 100 years and it's a property development group. And like h and it uh, also issued a profit warning recently. But in, in a similar vein to what Graham was saying, I don't think that this needs to be seen as a major drama for the business or a major concern for shareholders, probably. So I think the main part of the group has land management, property development, house building and construction activities. But I think where the engine really of the business is the land business that drives quite a lot of profit and gives a very long term quality to it. Whereas builders and construction companies see things go from boom to bust. If we look at the land business here, which is called Hallam Land Management, last year they sold around 2,000 plots, I think, to house builders. And then in 2022, they sold about 4,000. So obviously last year wasn't a great year, but their overall land portfolio contains around 100,000 plots and about 8,500 of those have planning. So looking at the numbers, you would have to think that there might be getting on for 20 years supply in that pipeline. And one of the things I like about the business is that it does operate on these long time timeframes. In the update this week, they talked about a land project where they'd first got options to buy an area of land in Swindon more than 20 years ago. And now they've just sold some plots to Vistry, their house builder, and they're in a position now to see the returns, having done the work and got outline planning and so on. So what they've said is that while last year was in line with forecasts, 2024 is looking like it's going to be a bit worse than expected. And, and really that seems to revolve around house building house builders who have agreed to buy land seem to be stretching out the completion time for those purchases or the payment dates for those land purchases are now expected to be i think a little bit further out than previously expected and henry boots in the house building business is also maybe looking at taking a more conservative view on completions this year they say so presumably they mean they're going to sell fewer houses than they originally hoped to. I don't think it's a massive surprise and I don't think it's a massive concern because the business I think is in financially in quite good shape. There is a bit of debt there, but I think given the, the cyclicality and the long-term nature of the assets, I'd be surprised if it leads to any problems. And, and again, this is a business that has been doing this for a very long time and it still has some of the original family ownership. It's a pretty solid dividend record for a property business. And currently is trading to a, quite a decent discount to book value. So the last reported book value was 303p, I think, in June last year. And the shares are under 200p at the moment. So around a third below book value, lots of lots of tangible assets and a very long track record of, of doing this kind of thing successfully and also targeting returns on capital kind of over 10% as a general rule. Although that's not a spectacular return, I like the fact that the company does use it as a key performance indicator and it's been quite consistent with that. So in short, I think that there's probably some value here if you're patient and willing to ride out what's left of this kind of housing downturn. The valuation seems attractive and the business has a sufficiently long track record that I think it's likely to continue doing what it does successfully when conditions are more favorable. Graham, I don't know if you've looked at Henry Boot recently as well. I was studying this this trading update as well. I think this has a lot in common with H&T, a completely different sector, of course, but just in the sense that they've over-promised and under-delivered over the last little while. They've had to reduce their expectations and the returns, as you say, haven't met their target. So I think the return on capital is only around 6%, which is very underwhelming and I would say below the cost of capital definitely needs to improve on that point. And I suppose the questions that I was asking was firstly, what's going on with this? the house builders? They said they agreed to extended payment profiles with the house builders. I'd be a little bit curious about what was the negotiation there? Is it just the house builders are, as you say, the house builders are struggling a little bit? But was there any way that Henry Boot could have got paid a little faster because the net debt is not at a level that they themselves are particularly happy with? And the other thing is, I suppose, just the fact that they blamed interest rates and inflation. That was what they specifically mentioned as being problematic. But actually, like both of those measures are probably a little better than we could have hoped for, at least in terms of the outlook for them. And in the case of inflation has fallen, as investors would have hoped, it's, I think we're at the kind of bullish end of the spectrum there in terms of what could have happened to inflation. It feels like their forecasts were just too optimistic. 
if they've had to warn, despite inflation cooling, despite the outlook for interest rates having become more dovish. The argument was made very fairly against my presentation on HT that their forecasting has been a bit out, a bit too positive. But overall, I do agree with you that the stock is probably worth another look at this level. Personally, I've been bullish on it because of the discount to NAV and the fact that it does have a decent history and the management seem to be trying to do the right things. So yeah, overall, I agree with you and hopefully we'll get a more robust set of updates in the year ahead. Yeah, I think about the land payments to, to house builders. So these are effectively what would show up as land creditors in house builders accounts, I think, where they've committed to buy some land, but they haven't completed the purchase yet. And I don't have any inside knowledge of this, but from what I understand, it's possible or it's not uncommon sometimes for land payments to be linked to various sorts of development milestones like planning permission or maybe site infrastructure work. And it doesn't seem to me too hard to imagine that maybe the house builders are slowing down some of these things because they're pacing their own production of new homes. And so I wondered if that was one explanation why Henry Boot is talking now about these extended payment profiles, because they're, they're committed, but they're not in a position to rush things along on the original timescales that were envisaged. When you look at the balance sheet, they reported at the end of June last year, they showed nearly £300 million of land and work in progress, and then around £100 million of investment property and, again, work in investment property under construction. So there's a lot of tangible asset there. And on a kind of medium term view, I think it would be surprising if that was all needed to be written down substantially for any reason. I think that's that should provide some good underpinning, a bit like if, Mark, you were really, you were saying about Aria, that downside should maybe be limited in the end because there is plenty of tangible value. But do you see any value here, Mark? Are you sceptical, optimistic? Yeah, the, just what you described there, of, I was thinking through the incentives. And if you're the likes of a, a, a Vistri or something like that, then you definitely have an incentive to complete. And if I put the infrastructure into this site, I have to pay Henry Boot a certain payment. Whereas if they had plots somewhere else without that payment, the definitely the incentive is it to put all your effort into finishing the other sites using your resources. So I can easily see that why those payment terms would become extended. Does it affect the long-term value? I was, uh, again, just having a random thought the other day of how do we solve the current unaffordability of a lot of UK housing? And it's probably need to build more houses that people want to live in. And certain costs are fit, you know, or relatively fixed, the costs of bricks and timber and labor and, uh, and that kind of stuff. And so if, if there isn't the money to buy houses, I wonder whether it comes out of the land at the end of the day. But then you have planning restrictions and it, it, it all got a bit above my pay grade. But I guess my central point is that the land ends up being the most geared part of the property, the property cycle. So hearing that their the majority of their value is land, it, it, it gives me pause for concern. But it doesn't seem like they've taken massive write downs in the past. And I can easily see a sort of 50% upside here from the tangible book value they have. But the question then is, how soon does that arrive? If it arrives in two years' time, you've actually got a pretty good sort of 20% plus compound return. But if it takes five years before the cycle returns and people are willing to pay the current book value for this business again, it, it's more like a kind of 8%. Realistically, for me, it's kind of somewhere in between. And a three year would be about a sort of 15% return. So that's that's interesting. That's worth doing some more work on for me. The question potentially is that, is the news in the housing market going to get worse before it gets better? Yeah, it's an interesting idea, but so far I've just avoided all house building and property and that kind of stuff out of fear for where we are in the cycle, but it will turn at some point. So maybe now is the time. What, what's your thoughts on the cycle timing aspect of this investment? It's, yeah, it's hard to know. You never know when you're past the bottom of the cycle until you are past it. It could get worse. I don't. I think there's obviously an element of maybe political risk is not the right term, but political factors at any rate that could play out over the next 18 months. So my feeling is that things are not getting worse. The rate at which things are getting worse has slowed down as far as I can tell 
for house builders and for other some other parts of the property market. But I don't know that I have any real great insight into exactly where we are in the housing market cycle. So I'm watching and, and waiting to see what will happen. I think the house builders don't look as cheap as they did a while ago and it's not quite so tempting at the moment as they were when they really hit bottom, whether that's a leading indicator or whether that's a full storm. I suppose we don't really know yet. Graham, did you have anything else you wanted to add on property or Henry Boot? You used the second derivative there, Roland, so I was just trying to get my head around that. The rate at which things are getting worse has declined. Yeah, I agree. It's worth saying there is a, a home builder within Henry Boot. There's a construction company. There's a developer and a land management company. So they do have their fingers in a lot of different pies there. The home builder, Stonebridge Homes, is still quite small, but they're working towards building 600 homes annually. That's showing that they're involved in different elements of the housing market and the land property market. I'm with you, Roland. I like the stock. In terms of where we are in the cycle, I don't really have a lot of faith in my ability to time the cycle, but the general outlook for interest rates seems to be lower, but not just in the UK, but in other Western economies. Inflation is stubbornly remaining above target and maybe even rising a little, which is slowing down central banks' ability to cut rates. But we probably will get those rate cuts eventually, but it could be still a little while off. Generally, what I would try to do with these types of stocks is just get that margin of safety and then not worry about trying to time the cycle to any great degree of precision. As I said, personally, I agree with you, Roland. I think there is a margin of safety here, but I could be wrong. And on that note, I think we can probably leave that there. So I think the final thing we we're going to look at today was a listener question about how we look at a set of company accounts, because I know that all three of us are regularly looking at company accounts and results for businesses that we're not necessarily all that familiar with to start with. So what are the main things we look at to get an initial idea of the quality and value of a business? What kind of things are immediate warnings, red flags, and what kind of metrics do we look at as a starting point maybe mark i'll come to you if i can i'm a great believer that you should have a, a sort of plan a kind of almost like a rule for how you read these things and and i go straight into the balance sheet i don't read the management commentary sometimes i don't even read what the business actually does and i go straight to that balance sheet and i have a look do i think this is a robust balance sheet that could survive a significant downturn in trading so i'll look at things like current ratios kind of debt levels you know, the level of intangibles, some of those fairly basic numbers, but they really matter to me. I'm likely to be looking at a business that like a value investment is going through some challenges. Being able to survive for the long term is much more important for me than buying some high flying software company that might be able to raise money from the market or, or trade out. I then look at the cash flow statement because that's the sort of second most important thing for me. And then the income statement. And then I read the management commentary and might find out what the business actually does. Uh, and I find having that discipline to look at those things. And, and it also saves time. If I don't like the balance sheet, I, I just don't go any further. And I haven't done a lot of work looking at the history of management and the history of, of whatever. Just metaphorically, the annual report in the bin and move on to something that I think is investable in. So in a nutshell, that's my process. Yeah, I can see you're, with your value focus, it makes sense to put a lot of focus on the balance sheet because profits and margins and, and things might not be where you hope they'll end up. But the fundamental support is important to make sure that the bottom doesn't fall out completely. What about you, Graham? Are you a balance sheet person, first and foremost? No, I, I wouldn't say I am, but I, I appreciate Mark's approach there is a way to save time. And I do think saving time is very important because there's far more information than anyone can reasonably grasp. Personally, I tend to have investments or potential investments categorized in one of two buckets. The first bucket is quality stock. And the second bucket is a potential value stock. And sometimes, very occasionally, you, you get something that falls into both. So for example, if I'm looking at a house builder or Henry Boot or financial stocks, in those cases, 
I want the company to have a solid balance sheet first and foremost, because their balance sheet is what they are using to generate a return. Financial stock, like an insurance company or a lender, they are using their financial assets. They're deploying them in such a way to generate a return. And so I need to know how big the balance sheet is, first of all, because that's going to determine how much capital they can deploy to generate a return. So these companies, broadly speaking, I value relative to their book value. So for those companies, the balance sheet is important, extremely important. And then you have the entire universe of other types of companies where you're valuing them primarily on the quality of their earnings. For those companies, it's not a value investment in the sense you're not looking for them to sell an asset and generate you a load of excess return that way. Basically, you want the business to succeed. And in those cases, I'm studying a lot of qualitative factors and other factors that may be quantitative in some ways, but are inherently qualitative. So again, this is stuff like market share and their ability to serve a wide variety of customers, that they're not dependent on any particular supplier, that the competition is weak, that management have their hearts in the right place. So all of those sort of quality investments are not fundamentally based on the balance sheet. And these days I tend to focus more on those types of investments. So that's basically it. I've got two buckets and two different frameworks and it saves me time because once I know what sector of stock is, I know which type of potential investment it is, and then I can analyze it. I think it's worth making the point that I find Stockopedia very useful for that process as well. And I'm not just saying that because all three of us write articles for Stockopedia, but that ability to look at the stock report and get a snapshot of what are the most important things about a company. And I don't think it's always the most detailed kind of way of analyzing a company. It's there are other financial providers there. But for me, that ability to look at something and get the key metrics really quickly, I find that really useful. Yeah, I agree that to being able to have that snapshot and just look at some key labels, sector information and and so on is useful. And and again, a real time saving thing. I suppose when I'm looking at a set of results, then if it's something, a business I'm not overly familiar with, I do generally have a quick skim of the management commentary, really just to see what the story is at the moment, or at least what we're being told the story is. Are things good and improving? Are things getting worse? And just a very basic idea of what I should be expecting to see when I look at the accounts. And again, for different types of company, especially financials, I might take a slightly different approach. But for the kind of businesses I'm generally looking at, well-established, profitable, and hopefully reasonable quality. What I want to do initially is really just get a bit more of a feel for what the quality characteristics of the business are and what its valuation is looking like. So I'll probably go down to the income statement and maybe look at the operating margin and possibly return on capital employed. And then usually one of the things I do quite early is to look at cash conversion. So free cash flow from net profit and is the business generating cash because I'm always looking really for reliable dividends and evidence of sustainability and an ability to reinvest in growth and so on. So the cash conversion is something I do look at quite carefully relatively early on and also the underlying profitability and as you say debt levels and general balance sheet health how do you measure that cash conversion because you get quite a lot of like different brokers use different ways of measuring that and and different companies as well so what what's your kind of key ratio for that what i look at in terms of free cash flow for a non-financial stock i tend to look at at the, I tend to exclude acquisitions unless it's a kind of buy and build type thing. There's always making lots of small bolt-ons, but generally just look at uh, the you know, operating cash flow, subtract all the finance costs, all the leasing costs, ongoing capex, and see how that compares to the after-tax profit of the company. And look for obviously cash flow, especially, can be subject to lumpy things that cause distortions on a year-on-year basis for whatever reason. I try and be conscious of that, but. What I really like to see is companies that converting kind of a high proportion of their after-tax profit into surplus cash each year. That's a real attraction, even if growth is maybe relatively modest at the time. Do you exclude like working capital in that or do you, do you include the working capital? Yeah, that's another thing that does cause big fluctuations year to year. In an ideal world, you wouldn't need to exclude it. But in reality, I think you, sometimes I do exclude it or average it out over two or three years to get a picture of the underlying cash generation. 
you can't completely ignore things like working capital because you do get these big swings with some businesses and sometimes it's a concern but sometimes it's quite innocuous i think it's just timing effects and external conditions in the market what have you so yeah it's a good point though you do have to have an awareness of that i think or you can get a bit of a distorted picture potentially yes useful I think the simplest free cash flow definition is just to take operating cash flow and subtract investing cash flow or simply subtract capex because you probably don't want to subtract voluntary acquisitions if you're trying to find out underlying free cash flow. There's this thing called free cash flow to the firm where you're supposed to add back interest taking the point of view of if you own the entire firm free of debt then you wouldn't have to pay interest so you can add that back in. That's a way of looking at it from the point of view of debt-free perspective. I tend to remove working capital because, as you've mentioned, it can be very volatile. And for companies that I look at in the small cap space, like we all do, you get these weird swings in working capital, which are very distorting. So I tend to try to ignore it, but that might be a little bit dangerous because if a company's growing, it does need more working capital as it grows. So you probably do need to make some allowance for that. The other or, thing- Or the reverse is if it's a software company and it's growing and it, it's getting paid up for kind of license fees, sometimes you can get a benefit from it. But then if they stop growing, suddenly you can get real trouble with that sort of business. I suppose another factor with working capital is you sometimes see companies that run with maybe even negative working capital or they rely on a customer payments coming in ahead of when they pay their suppliers or, or various factors like that. And, and it's often quite a good, nice model. But the only thing to watch out for is situations where that might be forced to unwind, where there's some sudden disruption to trading patterns and that can cause a problem. Although I've not seen it happen all that often, but it does happen. And it's one of those things that's possibly uncomfortable and can lead to a, to a sharp rise in debt that you might not have expected in a business that previously looked like it didn't need much debt. That's why most retailers fail, isn't it? Yeah, retail is a good example. And I think in an, an extreme example, at the beginning of the pandemic, the supermarkets had big stocks of fuel, which they're used to turning over very quickly. But all of a sudden, no one was buying petrol and diesel in the volumes that they were. And I think from memory, it was Morrison's that ended up that did explain the process they'd gone through. And they had a big cash outflow on fuel because they were having to unwind that position that the, the fuel would normally have been paid for by customers first before they paid for it. But personally, you mentioned free cash flow to the firm, Graham. As an, from an owner's perspective, I can see that's a useful metric. As an equity investor, I always subtract all finance and tax costs first to see what's really left over. But it is interesting to consider the contrast maybe between the two sometimes. Yeah. And one other important factor is lease accounting now and to make sure that we get leases, deduct them, deduct the entire cost of the lease, no matter where the lease payment is showing up in the statement of cash flows. Yeah, they appear in more than one place sometimes, don't they? And I always subtract anything related to leases on the basis that the company will be in trouble if those payments aren't met and they certainly won't be paying dividends. I'm not convinced IFRS 16 has really added a lot of value to the simple analyst like uh, of stuff. The quick tip is that you'll find a lease payment in the cash from financing activities element and you may want to just include that in your calculation of free cash flow as in don't ignore it make sure it's deducted because yeah it basically is an operating cash flow yeah and i suppose previously that would have actually been already subtracted higher up as an operating cost and now it appears down at the bottom so if you're only subtracting investing cash and not looking at the financing cash flow section you can miss those outflows on lease payments which are substantial for some businesses thank you for listening to the investors roundtable podcast we hope you enjoyed the discussions today and look forward to seeing you again next time.